Uh, Melbourne it has around 5 million people at the moment. We are growing at 300 people <coughs> per day. The recent census data confirmed that. And Plan Melbourne uh, is predicting that by 2051, there will be close to 8 million people in Melbourne. Now, Plan Melbourne is the state government's strategic planning document, which was recently released. As you can see there, uh, there is a push to uh, move more people into the regions as well, but Melbourne itself will still take the lion's share of the growth. Uh, Plan Melbourne identifies uh, a series of employment and innovation clusters. It also identifies a series of metropolitan activity centres where, which are close to significant transport nodes and will concentrate uh, commercial, retail and high density residential use. There's nothing very new about that. Um, Melbourne 2030 and all the former strategic plans have been talking about the polycentric city for decades. Um, the ac particular activity centres move around, sometimes one's more important than the other, but that has long term been Melbourne's aim, is to grow some of our uh, sub-regional centres. What we have, apart from and outside of these centres, is a large uh, residential area, the suburban areas and the inner suburbs particularly, where zoning controls uh, are very strong. Partly they are heritage overlays, partly there's neighbourhood character provisions, and partly there are just simply height controls. So on this map you'll see lots of pink. The NRZ, the pale pink, uh, and the GRZ are fairly locked down residential areas. NRZ is two storeys high, the GRZ three. Um, there's recently been some adjustment to that where the Minister has allowed people to at least build more than one dwelling on the NRZ blocks. Uh, but it is very difficult because politically to uh, let people build next door to you is not going to be very popular to any politician. So what we're left with is the RGZ zones, which are basically the thin strips along the transport corridors where there's a four-storey discretionary height limit, but that can be exceeded um, with effort and potentially going to the tribunal. So you see a large portion of Melbourne is fairly locked down, hence the importance of the central city, which uh, has a different kind of zoning. The capital city zone does not have third-party rights. So generally speaking, if it's not a heritage or a floodable area, then people cannot complain, object, take it to the tribunal. Whereas in the rest of the residential areas in Melbourne, that is the norm. So the capital city zone, the yellow areas that you see on that map, the Hoddle Grid and South Bank traditionally. Docklands, a little bit different. They have development agreements there with particular developers. And the other blue areas are all renewal areas around the centre. Melbourne, as has been pointed out, is more fortunate than Sydney in that it can expand fairly easily. So you see there that the Hoddle Grid and South Bank will continue to expand. Um, there will be another 120, 130,000 people expected in the next 30 years or so. Um, but those renewal areas will be increasingly coming on board. And only in the last two weeks, the Minister for Planning has released the amended framework plan for Fisherman's Bend, which is the, uh, down by the south side of the river. It is a huge area of where they're expecting 80,000 residents and 80,000 jobs to occur. Uh, and then a much smaller area to the north of the map is the Arden Macaulay area where the minister has approved the, some planning for the Macaulay part of that area and the development contribution. And there are still other areas like Egate, Dynan, which are coming on board. So Melbourne has plenty of opportunity to grow. Okay, I mentioned before the activity centres. So finally, uh, it seems to be taking off. We are actually getting significant development out of the central city. 
And the one that you'll see on the right is South Yarra, the Forest Hill Precinct, which has been going for a number of years. Um, but that particular building is 58 storeys high. It's under construction, at Bates Marv the Architects, Capital Grand. Um, and surrounding that, as some of you all know, is a, a whole series of other high towers. Now, that's fairly close to the centre. But for way out, nearly 15, 20 kilometres out, is Box Hill, which is the image on the left. And that is a 38-storey building by um, Pedalthorpe, I believe. And there are, at the moment, seven proposals for buildings over 20 storeys in Box Hill. So that is really taking off as well. And only in the last couple of weeks, there was an advisory committee decision about the land above the station which the council wanted to retain the height of 12 storeys, that has been thrown out and they've been asked to reconsider. So Box Hill is certainly taking off as a, not a competitor to the central Melbourne, but at least a, 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 com a companion to central Melbourne. And there are proposals in a lot of other activity centres. So it begins, looks like it's beginning to happen. The central city, um, so there's still, a large pipeline of development in Central City. This image is now a year old, but it just shows you in colour the possible change that would happen in Melbourne if all the permits eventuated and were built. So the grey ones are actually under construction, the blue ones are approvals with permits, and the yellow are applications, which have, some of them have been determined, some of them are still being considered. So you can see a massive change to Melbourne coming if even a portion of those buildings were built. It represents 50,000 apartments, um, virtually very few offices, nearly all apartments. So this boom, what it's meant to the central city is the development of more and more constrained sites, more and more small sites. And you'll see on this slide, the sites as small as 163 square metres with a uh, an 85 metre building on them, um, and other sites which have floor area ratios well over 50 to 1 on a site which is 1,000 square metres or less. It's all well and good when you see them as you do in these images by themselves, but when the site next door or the one adjacent to that is also developing, um, we have some serious problems. Uh, it's problems of equity for the neighbours, and as problems of amenity for the people who live there, and as problems for the streets and the public realm of overshadowing and wind effects. So uh, in 2015, the state government began work with the City of Melbourne on reviewing the built form controls for the HODL grid and South Bank, not Docklands, because as I said, that has a different regime of control through development agreements. Um, that a year ago now, uh, came in as Amendment C270 to the planning scheme, which varied what you can do in the central city to address the issues of very intense development, particularly on small sites. So basically the area is divided into two, er two zones, if you like. The special character areas in, uh, in yellow are Places like Burke Hill, which is historic, the uh, centre of the city, which is the retail core, along the Yarra River, naturally enough, and down Sturt Street, the Arts Precinct. There always have been for many years, and there will remain height controls in these areas. It's a mix of mandatory and discretionary. Um, there's now a backup or background floor area ratio to guide where the height is discretionary, and it does allow you to consider some options within a, a range. The blue areas on the other slide show the general development areas where there is no height control. Um, there is a de facto control by the aviation authorities when you get around 300 metres tall, um, but there is no particular limit cap in the planning scheme. What was introduced or reintroduced was a floor area ratio for these areas. Okay, so what were the main points of the amended controls? First of all, it's the relationship to the street. Melbourne, as you know, or some, most of you have seen, has a very regular, very robust, but very 
traditional um, streetscape along the grid, which is fortunately a fairly low height human scale uh, with many historic buildings. So that has been a feature of Melbourne, building up to this grid, defining the grid, providing an active frontage. And so that was what we protected by putting a preferred street wall height of 20 metres, which is less than what it used to be at 40 metres um, because actually much of the city is lower at 20 metres and it is a more pedestrian friendly scale. There are ways and places where you can justify a higher street wall height. So street wall height was the first point. The second point, separation between buildings. Many planning schemes, including the Melbourne planning scheme, had a recommended separation between towers that was 24 metres. It never happened because it was always, oh yes, I'll do my bit, the neighbour will have to do his bit when he comes along. So the controls were redefined to make the setback to the boundary of the site. You had to manage your amenity within your site. And previously, uh, the setbacks had been as low as five metres, even for 200 metre tall buildings. They are now proportional to the height, so it's 6% of the total height. A 200 metre building was set back 12 metres from the boundary. So if you have two of these guys together, they would be separated, the traditional magic 24 metres. So it's, that is providing the breathing space between towers, both for amenity, to let the, the, the sun through, to let the wind pass, and to, for people to see the sky. That image there is the top end of Elizabeth Street, which in part was the area which provoked the minister and other people to step into action um, because it's a, a fairly dense little part of the world and you will be seeing it if you haven't already. Uh, the third main pillar of the controls is the floor area ratio. Um, as I was saying, many buildings that were getting permits were well over 50 to 1. There was nothing given back um, in response to that to the public realm or anything else. Uh, in the past, Melbourne had a 12 to 1 floor area ratio back in the 70s, 80s. So we've moved from 50 to 1 and an average floor area ratio of 35 to 1. The average of the floor area ratio of the buildings the minister was dealing with was actually 35 to 1. Uh, so the base is now 18 to 1. There's no cap, provided the site can take it and provided you're providing public benefit and there are agreed categories of public benefit, things like through block links, open space, uh, commercial uses because office uses are strategically desirable, then you can go higher. Uh, that image is um, 600 <coughs> columns by Zaha Hadid for Landream and that one was under the interim controls but it, which was a 24 to 1 plot ratio, but they uh, worked that up to 29 to 1 from memory because they provided through block links some internal spaces, etc., and they respect the setbacks, so we're now getting more breathing space around that tower. <coughs> Overshadowing was reviewed completely. Uh, the state government has their own 3D model where they can test all applications and see those in the light of what exists already and what is permitted on other sites. So there was a complete exercise to determine which were, with the City of Melbourne, which were the key spaces which had to be protected, the ones in red, along the Yarra River particularly, which did cause a bit of an outcry because it limits the southern fringe of the city, the heights that you can go because you should not be overshadowing the river. Um, but that has been upheld. And there are a few other particular spaces like Fed Square, the State Library Fort Court, which are also mandatory, and the Shrine of Remembrance, the War Memorial. And then there are other spaces which have discretionary controls. The, whole, the times were reviewed. Um, it's become much more sophisticated because of modelling. Architects always produce models now. They can always be imported into the control model. So it's quite simple to actually check shadowing. Wind controls were also reviewed. Um, Melbourne's a very windy city. Um, it, it was made very clear in the scheme now that we do need wind tunnel tests for anything over 40 metres high. Um, there's a safety uh, criteria of 20 metres per second, which you cannot um, break. 
and then for other times there's a 80% comfort levels which depend on the type of activity it is, whether it's sitting at a restaurant or just walking down the footpath which has no particular activity. Um, then the specifics uh, of the controls. If you have a small site, there is a fair amount of flexibility to go up to 80 metres high, 25 storeys more or less. So you can build to one of your neighbouring boundaries if, if the neighbour's neighbouring property allows it. You can build to the corner. You have five metres setbacks only in other sides. Uh, it's fairly flexible up to 80 metres to allow people to develop those smaller sites. If, on the other hand, you want to go really high, and you can because of your site, then you have the same controls around the base with the street wall height, the preferred 20 metres, um, justifiable in context, up to 40. And the setbacks, five metres minimum to the street, and the 6% to the other boundaries to the neighbours. However, there is an important caveat where you can adjust that position and shape of that tower, because we do not want to get a series of boxes, all rectangular and all following each other evenly spaced down the road. So you can analyse the site and justify, because the building next door, for instance, is heritage and it's not going to be redeveloped, you can move closer to it, or you might want to move away from someone who in the past has built very close to one of the boundaries. Um, so what you can do is the floor area which you have allowed and calculated by your traditional setbacks can be moved. So it's not a discussion of yield where you get into an argument about we can fill out all the corners again, but it's about what you've got, you can move it to suit the site context and you can change its shape to make it round, for instance, to suit the wind or whatever. So there's, it's a fairly tight control, but it has those, um, that flexibility. The other thing which has happened recently after quite a lot of study in April, the better apartment standards were introduced, which owe uh, quite a lot to Sydney's experience, which is much uh, deeper than ours. Um, so they are having an impact naturally on tower design as well, and particularly the daylight provisions where the depths of floor plate are controlled. It isn't a sort of a mandated building width as it is in Sydney, but it is a depth of room to ceiling height, uh, and that is making narrower residential towers at least. Um, it's about communal facilities, how many how much communal facilities you have, it's about minimum room sizes, etc. But it doesn't have a minimum apartment size per se. So all of that is having quite a big impact, not only in towers, but across the board, across the city. But anything above um, four storeys. And some of the controls apply to the traditional res code for below four storeys. So recent trends, um, the residential market in the central city at least has cooled off and that's partly because of financing from overseas and it's partly because of a potential oversupply of smaller <coughs> investment units on the market, it's a couple with that. But we are seeing much more sophisticated schemes. We're seeing office buildings that have come back. There were five permits floating around for office buildings for <coughs> up to five years, um, unacted upon. I think now three of them have been acted upon and there are new proposals such as the one there by Cox for 130 Lonsdale Street, which is an office building next to the Wesley Church. And we're seeing um, a large number of hotel proposals as well. The other one is Cox Fender Katsalides, uh, 308 Exhibition Street, which is Shangri-La combined with apartments in the other tower. Uh, and apart from that, we're actually seeing really genuinely mixed-use buildings where people are putting a mix of offices, residential hotels and other things together to make a, a comprehensive offer to make it stack up. Now, all this is leading to greater interest, greater quality, uh, and it's, it's very encouraging. So, just to finally, I mean, Melburnians and Victorians generally have taken to apartment living. They are certainly learning to trade off space for proximity to work and services and lifestyle. Um, and I strongly believe we're going to continue to see 
more and more apartment living. The big issue, uh, which we'll have to grapple with, and in New South Wales they have tried to grapple with it through the strata titling regulations, is the fractured ownership of these high-rise buildings, um, and the, which means that there are potential future issues for maintenance and eventual redevelopment because of the huge costs involved and whether you get agreement from all the owners. Uh, that is a big issue. It's been an issue in the United States for some time in places like Florida. Um, and it's something which really has to be grappled with, the resilience of high-rise longer term as a residential asset and how we can modify the governance and also the um, design of these buildings so that they are more robust to actually maintain and more robust to replace parts of and adapt. So, because otherwise we're going to have a, an asset with us which is Im almost impossible to demolish, um, but which is um, visible for everybody to see. And it has to be looked after, and it has to be looked after well. Okay, that's, thank you.